Um, this is part of our series on uh, understanding creation, a book written by, uh, or edited by James Gibson and Umberto Rossi. There are 20 actual uh, chapters, probably about 19 or 18 authors, because um, it is one. Uh, well, no, I guess there's actually 20, 20 authors as well. Uh, they're written as questions, they're intended to be standalone, and when they were originally written, they were supposed to be 1,800 to 2,400 words. And uh, our chapter here is going to be one of the shorter ones. Um, this week, we're talking about can, can a Christian be a good scientist, uh, written by John Ashton. Now, for those of you who don't know, John Ashton uh, holds a Bachelor's of Science with honors in chemistry and a PhD in epistemology from the University of Newcastle, Australia. He also has a Master's in Chemistry from the University of Tasmania. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Australian Chemical Institute in 1992 and has held senior positions in tertiary education and industrial research for more than 30 years. He's currently strategic research manager for the Sanitarium Health Food Company and also serves as adjunct associate professor of biomedical sciences at Victoria University, Australia. Which means he teaches occasionally there, I guess. Um, he co-authored more than 100 science-related articles and research papers as well as a dozen books. And uh, one of the books that he edited has a chapter by me and I think also a chapter by Ariel Roth that's called In Six Days. <coughs> now, <coughs> my approach uh, to, how, to the uh, subject in general and his, um, uh, his answers, uh, the question as given is almost too easy to answer. Uh, John Anston answers it by describing scientists he has met, and he also goes over the history of science. Um, he talks about Christian scientists, including short-age creationists. He talks about the Christian roots of science. And finally, he uh, has a few rather interesting um, attacks on unguided evolution. Um, he doesn't really make a case for whether uh, Christianity is good science. He's, he's specifically talking about can a Christian be a good scientist. And with that orientation, we'll begin his chapter. Studying science can be one of life's most exciting and rewarding experiences. However, Christians studying science can sometimes be challenged by teachers and fellow students claiming that only people who are uneducated or ignorant of the discoveries in biology, geology, archaeology, and astronomy could still believe the Bible account is true. Let me reassure you that I have met and talked with many outstanding scientists who not only believe in the miracles of the Bible, but also testify in their personal lives and their scientific careers. And he refers you to one of his books. Um, in fact, it was Christian scientists who helped me to come to know Jesus as my savior. Let me share my experience. I began my career as a trainee physicist at the BHP Central Research Laboratories in Australia now the world's largest mining companies. In the 1960s, BHP was already the largest steel maker in the Southern Hemisphere. I was appointed assistant to a recently arrived scientist who had been a university academic gold medalist and had just completed postdoctoral studies at Imperial College London. He was a meticulous record keeper. Every page in his logbooks was pre-stamped with a number. All results had to be recorded apparently so that you couldn't take out pages without them noticing that they were missing. All equipment needed to be kept in full calibration with reference standards regularly checked against primary standards. From him I learned the techniques of first class research. He also talked to me about Jesus. At the time I was a nominal Christian who ticked the Methodist box on forms. Because my supervisor was a Christian concerned for my salvation, he urged me to read the book Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, which I did. This scientist's lifestyle was a sharp contrast to that of most others in our section who had also been educated at top flight institutions like Cambridge University and the Massachusetts Institution of Technology. They were usually either heavy smokers or drinkers. 
In my early teens, I had made my own decision to never smoke or drink. As I observed the apparent emptiness of these scientists' lives, who boasted of their drinking and saw the contrast with the positiveness of my Christian mentor, I began to seriously ask questions such as, is there really a personal God? And how can I find out about God? Midway through my studies, I changed from specialization in physics and mathematics to chemistry. And for my honors here, I chose a project that would be supervised by the head of the university's chemistry department. As I worked for this professor, author of internationally published textbooks, I learned that he too was a Christian. Whenever I went to his office, I was greeted with a beaming smile and a hearty, come in, John, what can I do for you? This was usually followed by some humorous comment, such as, have you found a girlfriend yet? He was never too busy to see me and always enthusiastically supported my research ideas while making guiding suggestions that I might like to consider. This professor, who was known for his positive nature and interest in people, gave me such encouragement that I achieved top of my honors class and was awarded a prestigious academic prize. Just after finishing my university degree, I began decided to begin attending church. I chose to go to a nearby Seventh-day Adventist church because my father, when my father had died some nine years earlier, a Seventh-day Adventist dentist had shown our family much kindness. Since this dentist knew that I was studying science, he had given me a very expensive slide rule. These were used in the days before pocket calculators, showing his age there. Showing my age, I know what he's talking about. Um, <coughs> I had looked up Sabbath in an encyclopedia and read that the biblical Sabbath was Saturday, so I knew that that was the right day to go to church to worship God. I applied for a postgraduate research scholarship, and I remember my first prayer asked God to help me get it. A couple of months later, I received a positive answer to that prayer when I was awarded the Tioxide Research Fellowship, the highest paying chemistry research scholarship then offered in Australia. I continued ten attending church on the Sabbath, and just over 18 months later, I accepted Jesus as my Savior and was baptized. As I look back on these experiences of 40 years ago, I praise God for his leadership in my life. Not only have I personally experienced many positive answers to prayer and enjoyed excellent health from following biblical health principles, I've also learned about the archaeological evidence supporting the historical accuracy of the Bible, and he refers to another of his books, and have researched the evidence for the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in another of his books. I've also learned that many of the scientists who laid the foundations of modern science were Bible-believing Christians. These pioneering figures include Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, Johannes Kepler, Carl Linnaeus, Michael Faraday, Samuel Morse, Charles Babbage, Matthew Murray, James Jewell, Louis <coughs> Pasteur, um, George Mendel, Lord Kelvin, George, Joseph Lister, James Clerk Maxwell, and Joseph, J pardon me, John Ambrose Fleming. Um, and he gives a reference for the, that list. For example, Maori, a pioneering oceanog oceanographer, believed that the Bible could be used as a guide to understanding nature. After reading Psalm 8.8, which talks about the path of the, paths of the seas, he looked for those paths and discovered ocean currents and much more. And uh, it's the same reference. Leading philosophers, such as Lynn White, who taught at Princeton, Sanford, and UCLA, recognized that it was the Western Europe's Christian worldview dominating in the Middle Ages that provided the environment for science to flourish there and not in other parts of the world where non-Christian cultures dominated. Science could not make significant progress in these cultures because of the perceived risk of offending local gods or because the culture's focus was on discovering signs and purpose in nature. Within the Christian worldview, British scientist and philosopher Francis Bacon successfully proposed that scientists should work together to discover how nature worked and thus improve the condition of humans. And there's the reference. Um, or he has it in the book anyway. Um, following on from Bacon, French mathematician René Descartes believed that God had created mathematical order in the universe. He proposed that by studying small parts of nature in detail and summing the parts mathematically, the laws governing the universe could be discovered. 
Thus the concept of reductionism was conceived. When the devout Christian and Bible scholar Isaac Newton discovered calculus, it opened the way for him to explain many of the laws of physics that we know today. For example, the laws of motion and the law of gravity. The scientists who believe in God and the, crea the creator and the truths of the Bible laid, found, laid the foundations of modern science, which enabled subsequent generations of scientists to develop the technology we enjoy today. And he has another reference. As I think about the knowledge I have gained over the years, it makes me realize that there's those who have not read and learned the truths of the Bible who are in reality the ignorant ones. The characteristics of a good scientist, such as integrity, attention to detail, humility, willingness to recognize mistakes, inquisitiveness, the desire to search for and discover the truth, and caring for others and, not, and for the environment are all aligned with, if not directly based upon, the biblical Christian worldview. One aspect of science research is uh, research that continues to challenge me, however, is the widespread acceptance of the theory of evolution as an explanation of how life came to be, although there is still no experimental evidence to support this theory. Um, <coughs> it's probably uh, safe to say that there's certainly experimental evidence that's consistent with the theory. Um, but he's going to outline exactly what he means in just a little bit. Biophysicist Lee Spetner, who taught information theory at Johns Hopkins University for many years, points out that there is no evidence of purposeful genetic information arising by chance mutations. And on the basis of probability theory, it is impossible. And of course, he gives Spetner's reference. Also, there is still not, no known mechanism that can explain how a living cell could arise from non-living molecules. And I'd have to say those uh, two are true. In his latest book, Oxford University professor and atheist Richard Dawkins gives a single example that he claims is evidence of new and purposeful genetic information arising by chance. This example relates to the work of Richard Lenski and his team of researchers at the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics at Michigan State University. However, Lenski and his colleagues are not sure of the mechanism um, that produced the change in gen genetic information, and both possible mechanisms proposed by the researchers involve pre-existing information. Now, that statement is a little bit of inside baseball. If you don't know what's going on, you might not catch what's, what's going on. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background for that. Um, Hmm. That's the wrong window, just a minute. Um. And uh, there's a video going around, and uh, uh, this is uh, a piece of it, or the, the, the major piece of it. it, was gotten by Creation Ministries International. Can you give an example of a genetic mutation or, 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 or an evolutionary process which ha can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Can we just stop one? I think. I'm recording. There's a popular misunderstanding of evolution, which says that uh, fish turned into reptiles, and reptiles turned into mammals, and, and so somehow we ought to be able to look around the world today and look, and look at our ancestors. We ought to be able to, to see the intermediates between fish and reptiles, or between reptiles and mammals. We ought to be able to see fish kind of on the way to becoming reptiles. But of course, that's not the way it is at all. Fish are modern animals. They're just as modern as we are. They're descended from ancestors, which we're descended from. Way back 300 million years ago, there would have been an ancestor, which was the ancestor of modern fish and the ancestor of, uh, of modern, modern humans. And that ancestor, if you could have been there then, you could have seen the first steps towards a fish uh, 
say, coming out onto the, onto the land and, be, and becoming, um, becoming a, something like an amphibian. But that was a long time ago. You wouldn't expect to see that today. And so uh, uh, quite a lot of the misunderstanding of evolution, I suppose, I suppose stems from the fact that people are looking at modern animals and thinking that Darwin has said we're descended from them. Well, we're not. We're not descended from, from modern fish. We're not descended from modern monkeys. We're not descended from modern apes. They are modern animals just as we are. They are our cousins. They are not our ancestors. Now, that, of course, uh, uh, just a minute here. I'm not sure what that's for, but we can ignore it, I'm sure. That gives a little bit of the background of uh, the statement that, uh, uh, or the, uh, the statement that John Ashton <coughs> is citing for Dawkins. Um, the challenge, of course, is there any experimental evidence uh, of, of natural selection and mutation, uh, random mutation, producing uh, new material that wasn't there before. Um, and Dawkins can't think of any off the top of his head. And, um, or at least that's the way it appears in the, in the video. Uh, the claim made by the followers of Dawkins, and I think also Dawkins himself, is that in fact, at that point, he was so stunned by the question that he suddenly realized that these people weren't really interested in truth. They were creationists. And he was mad for being set up. Um, although I think that if you could make an a give an answer to that question, um, uh, you, you would have been better off to actually have answered the question than to have, uh, than to have uh, gotten upset because... Uh, people were there under which you considered false colors. Um, the fact of the matter is that obviously the question rankled him enough to where when he wrote uh, The Greatest Show on Earth, he uh, went ahead and uh, cited an example. And uh, what John Ashton is pointing out is that the there are two mechanisms that they think might have uh, explained where this new ability of the uh, of E. coli to metabolize a uh, uh, a particular uh, kind of sugar came from, and that that um, that that uh, that neither one of those mechanisms really actually built anything. It was more of a destruction of of a of something that previously prevented the organism from utilizing the uh, substrate uh, under anaerobic conditions. Um, and so there's there's more to what he wrote than might might be obvious to the uh, uh, to the person without that background. Anyway, he goes on to say, uh, Ashton does, in other words, the world's foremost advocate of evolution, Richard Dawkins, has not provided a single proven example of experimental evidence for the type of evolution that would be needed to produce the first eye, the first jointed legs, the first feathers, and the vast amount of new genetic information associated with all the different types of living things that exist. Leading educators admit there is still no known mechanism that explains how new purposeful genetic information can form. This remains a major research focus in biology. As one well-regarded educational website put it, and it's evolution.berkeley.edu, so it's not exactly a creationist-leaning site, um, <coughs> biologists are not arguing that these conclusions, that, uh, about these conclusions, that many biologists believe life on Earth has evolved, but they are trying to figure out how evolution happens, and that's not an easy job. 
In other words, we believe it, but we don't know exactly how it works. Over the years, I have met many leading scientists who have realized that the scientific evidence that we have available today strongly supports the Bible's account of how we came to be here. And he cites his book in six days. And uh, the subtitle is How uh, uh, 50 Scientists Who Believe in Creation. And he's collected 50 scientists who are short-age creationists with the idea that, yes, you can be a scientist and a short-age creationist. Um, I recently learned that former Cornell University gen geneticist John Sanford, whom we'll be hearing next week, inventor of the gene gun used in genetic engineering, has become a young Earth six-day creationist on the basis of scientific evidence showing that human DNA is deteriorating at an alarming rate and thus cannot be millions of years old. And uh, he cites Sanford's book and also a website there. Science is the study of God's creation. It involves observing nature and carrying out experiments that give us insights into how we can be the best stewards of his handiwork. Being a Christian and reading God's word, the Bible, gives us added insights from the creator himself. The Apostle Paul reminds us that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do the good works which God himself prepares for us to do. Ephesians 2.10 so can a Christian be a good scientist? I will let you be the judge of that. That's how the chapter ends. Now, my own take on this, I think there's several related questions here that are kind of being confused, or can be confused. One of them is, can a Christian be a scientist? And they, you know, you can, almost anything can do anything somehow. Can a Christian be a good scientist? which is a little bit different question. Uh, can a Christian make contributions to science? Um, again, uh, the real question is science making Christianity impossible to believe, which is, I think, closer to what is usually claimed. It's not that there can't be Christians and scientists, but you know, they're schizophrenic. They go to church one day a week, and the rest of the week they're scientists and they don't really fit them together well. And we have a few of them who say that on, uh, out loud on this campus. Uh, can a short-age creationist be a, scient uh, be a scientist and, or a good scientist? Uh, does science make short-age creationism impossible to believe? Which is a whole different set of questions because there are Christians who simply say God used evolution for uh, and, and don't try to fight the theory of evolution at all, um, assuming that evolution is science. Um, and, you know, one of the questions you have to ask is, well, how do you know? Because they say I'm a Christian and they say I'm a scientist, because they say I'm a Christian and because they have publications in scientific literature. Um, um, what are your criteria for a Christian and a good scientist, not only uh, theoretically, but also in practice to try to find out uh, whether somebody is really a Christian and a good scientist. And, of course, finally you come down to what is the definition of a Christian or a good scientist. And I'm going to put this in, in what I think is its strongest negative form and then kind of uh, leave it there and let you guys discuss it. The strong form of what I would consider a no answer to, can a Christian be a good scientist? runs something like this. A Christian believes in miracles. And that's relatively non-controversial, although there are some Christians, who, or at least people who call themselves Christians, who don't believe in miracles. I mean, the resurrection, uh, creation, uh, the exodus, any number of things like that. Okay. A good scientist, in their view, believes in the absolute regularity of nature without regard to human desire. I mean, other than that we control our own bodies in a certain sense, we don't control anything else, and there's nobody out there that takes any particular interest in what we think or what we want or what we need, and that arranges nature for our benefit. Nature is just there, and it takes no cognizant of human desires. And so there will occasionally be statistical miracles, but they will be rare. And uh, in fact, you can quantify their rarity. And uh, 
things like resurrecting a body just don't happen. In which case, people can believe all kinds of crazy incompatible ideas. But the two belief systems, as defined here, are incompatible. Believing Christianity makes it harder to do good science because you assume that a miracle could happen anywhere, including in the lab. And three, really believing Christianity and making it, you know, a practical and integral part of your life makes it impossible to do good science. And so they would say that insofar as a Christian is a good scientist, either his Christianity is defective or his science is defective. That, I think, is the strong form of the argument, and I will let you have at it. What about the strong form of the yes? Yeah, that's uh, don't you have another slide? That's questions and comments. <laughs> I am throwing this out to you. <laughs> I am not giving you the answer. So what do you say about yeah. that strong no form? I'll say something. Okay. <laughs> uh, seems to me one of the issues that uh, we need to address here in this whole question here is the question of the definition of science. Uh, until you define science, uh, more carefully, you're going to have confusion. Uh, there is such a thing as, you might say, legitimate atheistic science. I'm using that term atheistic, it's pejorative, and with intention. Uh, there is, a, I think, an honest question you can ask uh, without the... Uh, atheistic pejorative, what does nature say without including what does, what are the implications of it? In other words, the data of nature. What is the data of nature per se? At that level, uh, science is atheistic. Uh, but it is a fair question. Oh. What, what do I observe, uh, and uh, what does that seem to say, I think is probably a, a, a question. Now, where the thing is confounded, of course, is that science claims it's, it's truth, it is a superior way, I mean, I'm picking on the scientific attitude at the present, uh, some. It's a superior way of finding the truth, religion is inferior, uh, art is inferior, uh, music is inferior, science is on top of everything else. And uh, the attitude develops, okay, uh, I've got uh, this data, I'm sure of it, and uh, my conclusions are superior and don't bother me with the rest. Uh, this is where the thing gets confused. Now, adding to that, is the fact that when you limit your conclusions to the observable, you are closing yourself into a box that uh, may exclude truth. And uh, as such, you are no longer open to all truth, and you're liable to go down the, the wrong track. Uh, I much prefer, of course, the uh, approach that uh, let's be open to all possibilities. Uh, there is to say that the only truth is materialistic, is simplistic, uh, restrictive, and certainly no way to uh, uh, find truth if there's something beyond the materialistic. And 
I think most of us have to admit uh, there is. Uh, we don't have to think about, you know, our, for instance, our feeling of right and wrong. Uh, you know, it's pretty hard to boil that down to materialistic uh, concepts at present, although I, I don't put some psychologists past trying to do it. Uh, the, uh, so uh, there's that issue there of how you're going to find science. Are you going to find science as a, an atheistic uh, viewpoint? Okay, do it and state it. But when you define science uh, inconspicuously as a very successful thing and look at all of my, the data I have to support it, and then you draw conclusions beyond that, that's where science is in deep trouble philosophically. And that's what misleads a lot of people. And I think that that's an extremely important thing to realize uh, where materialism leads uh, when you're c considering ultimate questions, it's not a good way to go. Since the Big Bang Theory is defined as everything coming from nothing and is a momentary suspension of all laws of physics, what is the definition of a miracle? <coughs> Something that happens from nothing and that suspends the laws as we now know it. Therefore, if you believe in the Big Bang Theory, you have believed in a miracle, and therefore, by their own definition, they cannot be good scientists. And that's a problem. Uh, it was one that was intensely felt by some people, including Stephen Hawking, who proposed that because time and space are partly interchangeable, at the moment of the Big Bang, they became completely interchangeable and that you had, uh, you did not have a beginning, uh, a singular beginning in real time. Um, I don't think that solution has held and I think that your, uh, that your criticism of science is valid and suggests that perhaps the definition of science is perhaps faulty. Uh, this definition that says uh, science is the absence of miracle. Yes. Would you mind putting Does back the slide? Uh, oh, the, so one, the one before? Yes, yes, yes. So that, so that we can see that proposition again? Yes, yes. There. Um, is that what you wanted? Yes, thank you very much. But isn't the definition of a miracle something we don't understand? Um. And, and <coughs> aren't we as scientists always studying something new we don't understand? Um, it's it just that we try to figure out how it works. That's the point of it. I mean, uh, I have a beagle. He trusts us and we trust him. He doesn't understand calculus, and I don't try to teach it to him. But it doesn't mean that he's not knowledgeable about things. Uh, in fact, he knows a great many things. Uh, suddenly, uh, to suggest that he's not capable of learning uh, is kind of uh, absurd, simply because he's faced with someone uh, outside of his realm of comprehension. Similarly, by analogy, if we're faced with God, who would be outside of our realm of comprehension, does that inundate our ability to think? No, it doesn't. Because if we work on the simple assumption that God is neither capricious nor malicious, then he's not going to deliberately sabotage our thinking or our efforts. He's going to see in what way he can actually <laughs> help us do it well, not poorly or undermine something. And that seems to go directly against uh, most of the atheists who see God as essentially an adversary at best.
when we come into over here. I see science as a process rather than the end. This week's or this current issue of Discovery Magazine has a fascinating article about a man whose life work has been to uh, explore Einstein and Newton, uh, looking at the problems that they didn't solve during their lifetimes, trying to come up with something new. And he went through what everybody does. Uh, you know, he, he could not be an academic because of his outside thinking, but he's beginning to show new things that science will be reluctant to accept, but will generally, finally accept. Science is ongoing. It's not the definitive end <coughs> answer. And so we can be friendly towards science, just as uh, in our er area, as you mentioned, God is not understood totally by us, and we are told there will be revelation in heaven, and we will understand some things we don't know now. If you read the, the first chapter of Patriarchs and Prophets, in the last bit, it talks about Adam and Eve communing with nature, holding converse with nature. They obviously understood some things that we don't. They understood, he understood astronomy. And, the tiny insect moat flo floating in the sunbeam. and So there was a great deal of intelligence that has been lost. I think it's exciting to have science, and it's exciting to have religion. And I think we can be friendly, uh, realizing those who feel they have all the answers, well, they're perhaps just a little immature, aren't they, in their understanding. Thank you for drawing our attention to this week's Discover magazine. My copy arrived in the mail yesterday, too. <laughs> and I've read the article you've just quoted and uh, would re-echo what you said. Uh, the interesting thing is that the cover of that particular issue shows Albert Einstein with his hair way up here and presented on the cover upside down because the Discover magazine is willing at this stage of the, the uh, development of science to challenge a man who has been until recent times almost reverential. I mean, we, we dare not challenge Einstein. Truth. Yes, but we have reached the time now as you say, science is growing and expanding, and uh, the time has arrived when it is all right to question even somebody as, as holy as Albert Einstein. <laughs> uh, two weeks ago, just in confirming that, uh, I was present at a conference which was focused on cosmology, and believe me, at least four times in that conference, lecturers openly before 300 scientists were willing to dismiss Einstein as a theoretician that we should take notice of today. So you see, we're at a, a marvelous time of transition where, where science is questioning things which up till recently have been its very foundation. Now, miracles are another thing. I can go on on that. <laughs> can we pass the mic over? Uh, one of the reasons I introduced the question this way is because the question is read. It's just too easy. It only requires two words. And they are Newton and Faraday. You know, nobody would accuse Newton of being a poor scientist, I don't think, and nobody would accuse Michael Faraday of being a poor scientist, and they were obviously both Christians, so, I mean, yeah. But this is the harder one to answer, I think. Um, and I, I, my, my take of it is that uh, a good scientist does not have to believe in the absolute regularity of nature without regard to human desire. Um, it 
can simply believe in the regularity of nature in the vast majority of circumstances to where that's kind of uh, the way to bet. Um, and that, uh, that God's interventions are extremely rare uh, under Nargama circumstances. Now, of course, theologically, you may want to say God changes his actions very rarely rather than uh, God's interventions in nature are very rare because uh, for all we can tell, and certainly theologically it makes more sense, God is in fact managing nature under normal circumstances as well as abnormal ones. But the point of it is that that still allows us to investigate nature, to find regularities, and then to um, uh, use those regularities to try to understand uh, how nature is put together. Are and we willing uh, then to recognize and accept the reality of irregularities? And, and that's the point. As long as the irregularity is rare, you can still do science. And yes, so my the irregularity cannot be predictable. I, on the basis of nature itself, it not, might not be. On the basis of understanding the person who's, who's in charge of doing the irregularity, it might be very, un, uh, very predictable. In this class, uh, Dr. For, King. For example, let me give you an example of a predictable. Uh, uh, Jesus was able to predict his death with a, uh, with a great deal of certainty. Um, he was able to predict his resurrection and assuming that Christianity is correct, it was a uh, substantiated prediction and therefore um, probably an understandable one from the standpoint of Christianity. On the other hand, it's not something that science would predict. I have never in my career seen anybody get up uh, after being pronounced dead. The most I have seen is somebody's heartbeat return for a few minutes and then go back down, uh, away. In your memory here at Loma Linda... Um, yeah, it's working. Uh, has there been any, any public discussion that you recall of medical miracles, whether they actually occur, and whether we should, in this campus, recognize them as possible. We still pray for them, but without a lot of conviction that they are real. Um, I, those, those are also, I would have to say, extremely rare, at least from the experience of people that I've talked to but not so rare as to not exist. Um, and interestingly enough, they don't always convince the people to whom they happen. Um, and uh, I can remember somebody getting prayed for and anointed and standing up in church and saying, yes, that happened to me. Uh, and then later having been very skeptical of whether this was really a miracle because they discovered a new antibody that had made his tumor go down. So now that we find a mechanism for it, we say God didn't do it. <coughs> well, well, this... Um, uh, but the, now the, there's another interesting story that was written in the review by a next-door neighbor of mine who at the time, well, he's no longer, he's no longer with us, but uh, at the time he was uh, an obstetrician in Singapore. And he prayed very specifically for a, a baby who was born not breathing and not resuscitated for about 25 minutes apparently. And then was resuscitated afterwards and not only survived, but had no noticeable brain damage. Um, 
And you know, the way he explained it, he said it's really hard to say other than that that was a miracle. Um, it is not something that we are at present able to pray up. And so I don't think we have a science of miracles yet. Dr. Geem, this whole Sabbath school class that you've been leading for years is on science and faith. Yes. Surely at Loma Linda University, we should be able and willing to come to grips with this basic question. Medical miracles. Why do we ignore the, the question? Uh, uh, well, there are some who feel that the subject is empty. And those people have the backing of the majority of scientists, I think it's safe to say. And I don't think our university is willing to stick its neck out and, and uh, go against something that has the backing of the majority of, of scientists. And I think that's probably a major reason why it doesn't get discussed often. Um, it would invite derision, wouldn't it? I, yes. I think so. After all, we pride ourselves on our scientific acumen and... Yes. We have a comment up here and then Ariel Roth. I'm going backwards from this discussion back to previously. Um, most science I, that I am familiar with is you start with a hypothesis and then the good part of good science is that you are objective and truthful in, anal in analyzing your data to see whether it fits with your hypothesis, it proves it or disproves it. Since you start with a, a theory of evolution or you start with a theory of intelligent design or creationism um, as a working theory, then a good scientist would be objective and careful and and how he looked at the data and interpreted the data. And so the definition of a good scientist would be the integrity, the thoroughness, and the carefulness and objectivity which they did, not necessarily whether the hypothesis that they were trying to prove or disprove was good to start with or was a valid one if it couldn't be proven or disproven anyway, which both evolution and creationism are stuck in that position. So I believe a good, can a Christian do good scientists? Yes, they can be ethical, they can be objective, they can do thorough work, and then if the definition is that, then they're good scientists. If the definition is they agree with me and my theory, then I suppose they can't be. So in our, um, in our uh, statement here, the problem that you have is that a good scientist believes in the absolute regularity of nature without regard to human desire is not something that uh, that you would find uh, uh, a good a good a definition of science, and that's the problem with this uh, line of reasoning. Well, wouldn't would it not be a scientist to hypothesize that nature was not regular and therefore study the evidence for or against that? Would he not be a good scientist as long as he did that with a careful? Fashion? Um, or perhaps the, irregularity, or the irregularities are, are of a different nature. And I agree with you. I think that you'd have to say uh, that uh, unless you start out with the idea that a good scientist must be an atheist, it's hard to get to that definition. Uh, getting into uh, Danilo's question about, you know, what, what is a miracle? Uh, let me try and avoid that issue which uh, needs to be answered by simply stating, to me, a miracle is where God performs something beyond the normal laws of nature that we are familiar with. So let, let, let's define that. Uh, having said that, uh, two things I want to say. One, miracles do occur. Why do I say that? For one thing, my science tells me they had to occur on the basis of my definition of science and my definition of, of miracles. They had to occur, for instance, origin of life, as Ashton mentioned in, the, in his book and so on. You know, it's, it's, it's a closed case in a way. People are trying desperately to open that case, but not without much success. Yeah, uh, but if you're going to be uh, reasonable, 
you, you've got to say, hey, no, no, the miracle had to originate life. We have no scenario whatsoever that comes uh, close to even suggesting it, let alone proving that it did occur that way and not the way the Bible says it occurred. Uh, the other or even that it could have occurred that way because, uh, I mean, other than a appealing to a, a massive chance in a, in a way that uh, nobody would ev ever do uh, in real life. Yeah. The, the other point I would make, however, is uh, uh, I know miracles do occur from personal experience. I uh, am glad that they don't occur all the time and everywhere because we don't understand miracles. Reality would be irrational. Reasoning would not be possible. God would be capricious and uh, so on. It gets back to the history of this that science did not develop in capricious philosophies like the Hindu and Chinese philosophies. Uh, they had capricious gods and so on. It developed in a milieu where God was rational. The God of the Bible is rational and so on. So uh, we should not expect too many miracles. But we know they do occur. Uh, and our science tells us this. Uh, anyway, that, but I, I feel more secure in that area. You have all asked all interesting things and my question relates to when Satan was in heaven and he sinned or he was having difficulty and God talks about the mystery of iniquity is there still no mystery left about Christianity I, I think we have um, a lot of mystery about Christianity, uh, people will at, at this point always ask, uh, why did God do it the way he did it if, in fact, there are miracles? Uh, I mean, that's, that's obviously true. You know, theologians get all the miracles and they try to figure out what's going on. Not so much as they won't ask the mechanism because the mechanism may be forever beyond our reach. But they will ask at least the, uh, the uh, question of, is, is there some rational sense that you can make about knowing a little bit more about the, the person who did the miracles because of what miracle happened? Very much like you would ask the question of what kind of a personality is somebody f partly from uh, what kind of actions that person did. Uh, on your point uh, down here, the second one under the strong form of the no answer, a good scientist believes in the absolute uh -huh. regularity of nature, uh, but the traditional scientists uh, believe in the absolutely irregular unsupervised phenomenon of evolution, which is not absolutely regular. I, I don't see how you can put those two together. Well, I, I think that gets back to the point that... Uh, He's putting that the randomness of evolutionary yeah. steps. Yeah. And well, how, how, how did it come from that random thing, this absolute regular thing, and, and it's, it's all one piece? It, it doesn't fit. Well, you know, it, it's almost like the definition is designed to exclude God, and that's all. That's right. And I had one comment about miracles. What was it? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I guess I'll have to let it go. Uh, you, did you have a comment a little earlier? I hate to be contrarian, but... Oh, you're not. 
<laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking in a different direction. Um, I'm, I just wonder, I, I can see the validity of the concern about miracles. I do. And I feel I, I, my uh, data that is in my area of knowledge is that there are miracles. Absolutely. But what if that's really not the question? What if this is a red herring? Because um, it used to be that, I mean, this was the joke, that the only people who did not believe in the supernatural were academics on the east and west coast of the United States and some places in Europe. Well, that's a joke. But still, everybody believes in the supernatural. And what does science have to say about that? Well, some areas of science try to study it and say this is orderly too. Just it's not under the control of humans, although some areas of science uh, want to make that under control of humans, and they have all kinds of systems for that. I guess we call that magic. Or maybe folk religion, depending on which school of thought you're coming from. But again, I find great comfort in theology that sees time as linear. And looking at evidence in the scientific world that time is linear, and that there is supernatural, and there's a war going on. And within that framework, we can have evil supernatural, and we can have good supernatural. And so to look at miracles within that context is a whole different way of looking at what good science is. I think we'll all agree that science I thought somebody went on the mic. Science uh, understands that the heart and the brain are connected to each other, but can science really explain why the heart beats? Well, there are, at least at some level, explanations of why the heart beats. And... Uh, I guess I would I would be a little cautious about uh, using those kinds of things as arguments uh, because I think that if you were to get down to it, the real problem is not uh, that the heart beats. I mean, there are certain mechanical things that happen uh, having to do with ion gates and electrical flow and so forth that will allow certain cells to set off regularly uh, uh, electrical uh, charges on their surface uh, and then uh, pass those on to other cells and we can even outline which cells are doing it and roughly where they're located um, and uh, and which cells are then responding and then delaying and then responding again so that you get the atria beating and then the ventricles beating. There's actually a mechanism for that. Um, if you see a watch, you look at it, and you can actually understand that this gear turns this gear, turns this gear, turns this gear, and that this spring provides some motive power for the whole thing. And um, uh, once it's created, it kind of runs by itself, so to speak. The, the creator doesn't have to continually monkey with it to make it work well. On the other hand, um, the creator 
uh, to get the watch without a creator is a little more difficult. In other words, the creator of a watch is able to endow material with information of very specific kinds that have certain tolerances. And it runs without momentary intervention. There isn't somebody sitting inside the watch or, or outside the watch with a long stick or something, turning the, the, the wheels to make sure that it shows the proper time and so forth. But that kind of thing doesn't happen if you uh, uh, if you watch volcanic eruptions with uh, you know lava coming out, it doesn't spontaneously form into watches. Nor does weathering make that kind of pattern. And so, the the real question there is not so much the the watch itself. Uh, 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 correction: the real question is not so much how the how the watch runs, as it is that there's a watch to begin with. And of course, that is a famous um, example that has been used. Now, I think we had a question way back. Poses the fact that Christianity worldview actually is the most logical point of view because there is no basis for the laws of logic and the ability to reason and the ability to observe, etc., outside of being created in the image of God and the image of God that can do those things and endows those things to us. So the, the Christian worldview that views our ability to do those things and the existence of reason, the existence of intelligence, the, the existence of logic is a logical approach coming from a logical creator that has those characteristics in themselves as opposed to the random. So if you look at the criticism of believing in a miracle uh, as being irrational for a scientist because it doesn't follow its observable, then going back to taking God out of the picture with a worldview that doesn't have those characteristics is even one step backwards. It becomes irrational on the other side of the argument that we can have the ability to rant and think and laws of reason, etc., exist without there being a reason for them, and God provides that reason, the most logical approach. And I think you have uh, hit a very important point. Um, the, quote, irrationality of miracles. First of all, may be rational from an entirely different perspective. Let's supposing that the second coming happens. it may defy some of our presently known physical laws. But it will definitely not be irrational in the sense that God is coming to claim his own and to wrap up human history as we see it. It will make perfect sense from a teleological point of view. It just doesn't make sense from a mechanistic point of view of the mechanisms that we know and I, I think that behind that kind of definition is a hubris that says, we know all of the mechanisms, which is patently not true, because we have no clue as to the mechanism behind quantum mechanics. And in fact, uh, uh, the most popular school of quantum mechanics is probably called the shut up and calculate school. <laughs> And the other, t the other two, one of them requires violations of relativity, which if Einstein is wrong is not a big deal, but if Einstein is right is a big deal. And the other one requires uh, that the universe isn't even put together the way we think it is. Um, and, and you're right about if we were in fact, evolved to survive. There's no reason for us to appreciate music. 
there's no reason for us to uh, uh, understand mathematics, and there's certainly no reason for us to be able to understand that the universe is built this way, and in fact is not built for our survival at all. Um, if, if the universe really were that way, we would have to be doing science by the shut up and calculate method as well. And the fact that we can kind of get some understanding of how the universe is put together suggests that uh, our minds are unreasonably uh, well-tuned to understand it, unless, of course, you assume that there is a greater mind who made the universe and made us at the same time. Because the one thing that's obvious is we didn't make the universe ourselves, and therefore its rationality can't be attributed to us. So there has to be some greater mind that's, that's running the whole show uh, from that point of view, or else you have no explanation for the rationality of the universe itself. One final comment. I appreciate what you're saying about miracles. I think the Lord does not perform more miracles um, for a couple different reasons. One, if, if we were too often or too frequently, it would make things look capricious and be harder to understand and follow the logic. And the other is, is that we tend to view things from our own perspective. As a younger man, I struggled with the Christians when we killed them. Colosseum, why God didn't step in and do that. And then suddenly dawned on me that was the first death, and that if he did, they would live to die and suffer some more here on earth before they would have the resurrection. Whereas once they were killed in the Colosseum, the next thing they knew was the resurrection. And it is what we often pray for is not necessarily a blessing to the people that we ask for the miracle for. And we have a very limited perspective on life, and God has much more understanding of what that means if he answered our he understands what it means if he answers our prayers and miracles are performed. I think miracles are performed to serve his purpose in the overall history of this earth and the, the message that occurs not so much for our own desires. We had a comment here. I, I remembered what I was going to say about miracles. It seems to me it's the scientists and the theologians that have a problem with miracles. I hear about miracles on the news every day. Fascinating perspective, and I think you're right that, they, that really the intellectuals are the ones that have more trouble with miracles than, than most ordinary people. When we think in terms of miracles, what, what, what is really a miracle if it isn't when someone intervenes with a process which would otherwise uh, go on its merry way? So if someone intervenes, uh, we actually have a science to deal with such interventions. We call it forensic science. And we actually employ it quite well to de deduce who did what to whom, and, and, and why, and how, yeah. and all of these kinds of questions. So at no point do we say, oh, well, this was a miracle. The bullet didn't just somehow manage to materialize inside the brain. You know, we, we kind of want to know mm, the whole process that led up to that final state. Um, and um, so the problem that I think your question alludes to is not so much the dealing with the unexpected, but rather it is uh, dealing with what I would call sloppy faith, where people, uh, yeah, you've heard about this approach where it says, don't think about it, just believe. Um, because if you think about it, it's, you're going to trip yourself up. Well, there is a time for trust. You know, when it's time to be obedient to God and clear, explicit instruction, then we want to philosophize. That's the wrong time to do that. But when it is time to learn something, then we should be exploring what we have been instructed to see the whys and wherefores, because there must be a reason for all of that. God doesn't just give instructions 
just because. You know, and lazy thinking brings the faithful to little learning, and because of that, little progress. On the other hand, sloppy thinking by such evolutionists brings them to conclusions which obviously don't hold water in my thinking. So I think there seems to be a lot of laziness in, in thinking going around on both sides. Well, with that, uh, I think I'm going to, to uh, close it up for now, and, and uh, we'll see you all uh, uh, next week over there, not here. It's at the Randall Visitor Center. Same time. Same time. Um, well, I imagine that uh, Ken Hart's uh, Sabbath School has somebody recording that. So. There will be, a, yes, there will be a record made of Sanford's presentation next week. I presume there was an announcement earlier, Paul, was there? There was. Thank and, you. Um, and uh, there's now an announcement at the end, too. So. Oh, Next week, John Sanford. The week after, we'll be back. <laughs>